almost got done in time. Almost got done in time. Well, welcome again to Mag Church. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Wilson. I am the family pastor here. And it is a pleasure to, uh, to bring this message to you this morning. Everybody say, not today, Satan. Say it with some attitude, not today, Satan. I love it. I love it. I love it. I don't know about y'all. Okay, so last week, last week I got to, to share a message with you. And um, I confessed my sin to you about loving Saturday Night Live when I was growing up. I know y'all don't have that problem because you're better Christians than I am, but I confessed it. And I don't know about y'all, but every time I hear this, this sermon series, Not Today, Satan, I, there's also another character that I keep thinking of on Saturday Night Live, and you might be thinking of it too because you know what I'm going to talk about, but it's the church chat with the church lady, mm. right? Y'all, y'all better, y'all don't watch Saturday Night Live, y'all don't get this is back in the good, when it was good. Okay, so, <laughs> and, and so uh, Dana Carvey had this, I got, I got to get that rid of that. Okay, Dana Carvey had this character, and, she, and it was the church chat with the church lady, right? And she would, she would, <laughs> right? And then, and then <laughs> she, when somebody would say, she'd always have a guest on, right? And they had messed up or done something that was really kind of bad, and she would judge them really hard. And I think it was really relatable because we all knew people in our church like that. We always knew a lady in the church. Hmm. And she would always say, well, isn't that special? <laughs> right? She would do it. And then when the people, and, you know, she'd bring up their sin or their whatever that mistake they had made and and be like, oh, church lady, I don't know what I did. I don't know why. I'm a sinner. All this stuff. And she'd go, well, I don't know who could have made you do it. I don't know who could, could it be Satan. Y'all remember that? And so every time I hear the word Satan, I'm like, Satan. So I don't know. I don't know if that's y'all. Now you're going to think that way. You're going to go on YouTube and look up church chat with the church lady now when you get home before your afternoon nap. And, uh, and you're welcome. So, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, uh, Jesus, please forgive me for watching Saturday Night Live and laughing at, at church. Amen. Okay. Just like that. So, yeah, but I, I, I think over the course of this series, we've learned that, you know, like the, you'll see this little subtitle there under Not Today, Satan. It says, When Enough is Enough. And so we've learned when, how, why to say Not Today, Satan. And, and how it's so imperative to do that in our lives, to be able to notice and be able to self-realize when something comes up, to say, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. not today, Satan. I'm not going to let that happen today. I'm not going to be deceived. I'm not going to be lied to. I'm not, I'm, mm -mm, nope, 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 not today. And I think that's important. But I think it's also important, and this is what we're going to talk about today, I think it's also important that we understand who the enemy is. Who the enemy is. It's good to have the knowledge of, of how to, to uh, uh, say no and not today and all that kind of stuff. It's good to have, I, I think also, though, that it's important to know our enemy because when you know your enemy, you can fight the fight. When you know the enemy, you can fight the fight for victory. Because there's a, there's a battle going on. I'm not sure that you're aware of that. There's a battle going on for our world. For you, there's a battle going on, and somebody is going to win. There's going to be a victor. So I think it's important for us to know the enemy. So this morning, we're going to talk about him. Why is it important to know the enemy? Because I, I think if we know the enemy, if, if, we, if we don't know who the enemy is, then we're going to think everybody is. Right? If we don't know who the enemy is, then we're going to fight anybody and everybody. We're going to misidentify the enemy and people are going to get hurt. Innocents are going to get hurt. Friends, family, loved ones, peers, co-workers, your children. They're going to get hurt because you're not going to know who the real enemy is. And you're just going to go off to everybody. And you're going to have people sitting there going, oh, what did I do? What did I do, man? You know what you did. It's just, it's just one of those things. So I think that it's very important to know the enemy. Has anybody ever heard of the art of war? I've read it extensively. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I do know that there's a principle in there when it comes to it's this ancient 
uh, text about battle principles and stuff like that and warfare and things. And in, in one, of the, one of the battle principles, it says this about knowing your enemy. Uh, it says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles because you're going to have confidence. You'll know what to do going in to win that battle, right? The second one, if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, there will also be a defeat. You'll also suffer a defeat. So yeah, you might win some, but you'll lose some because you know yourself but not the enemy. You don't know his tactics. You don't know what they're trying to do. So you'll win some, but you'll lose some. And then the last one here is, if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So we've got to know the enemy. Humans knew that, right? Even way back when, humans knew that. So, and, and so, so today we're going we're gonna to learn about our enemy. And I want to say this up front. I want everybody to look at me. I don't like talking about this. I don't like talking about him. I don't like giving him the time of day because he's a loser and an idiot and he's stupid. I don't like him. He's ugly. His mama's ugly. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't like him, okay? I don't like giving him the time of day. I don't. I really, I would rather talk about God and how he loves you and how he's got a plan and a purpose for you. And, oh, I'd like to, I, that stuff gets me fired up. Because God does love you. Uh, d- yeah, he does love you. And he's got a purpose and a plan for you. And he's created you. And he, and he wants you. Oh, he loves you. This guy, though, he's stupid. He's stupid. I don't like him. But I feel like, like I said earlier, it's imperative for, for us to know our enemy. So who's the enemy? Who's the enemy? I think all of us are thinking of that like that, right? The Satan. The Satan. The Satan is our enemy. The devil, whatever you want to call him. The, the, here's the thing, though. In the original b- biblical language, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? The New Testament was written in Greek. They never give him a proper name. Y'all know that? For, and, and so through our culture, through the, the many years that we've been alive and all the people before us, it culturally got to this proper name, capital S, Satan. Well, the biblical authors never give him a proper name. They don't even name him. We sometimes think it's Lucifer. No. No, that's, that's Latin. That's not even the original so, so it, they always, every, every time you look at the original language, uh, Hebrew or Greek, it's always the Satan. It's a title, right? So I think that's important. And, and listen, I'm going to say this all day, right? I'm not going to say, not today, the Satan. No, I'm going to say not today, Satan, because it makes sense. And that's what we say. It's not sin to say capital S, Satan. It's not, I'm just saying. Uh, but, but let's understand what the biblical text is saying so that we can fully understand our enemy this morning. I just want to share that with you. So the... Um, and, and I, I heard it this way. They didn't give him a proper name, and maybe we shouldn't either, because I think when we give him the proper name, like capital S, Satan, maybe it gives him too much honor, right? Because when you name stuff, you give it honor. You name stuff because you like it. I name my dog, right? I name a dog. I don't have a dog anymore. I did have a go- dog. His name was Bama. Roll tab. But I named him Bama because I liked him. He was, he was a cool dog, but I don't, I don't want to give this dude any praise. I don't want to give this dude any honor or the time of day. So that's why, you know, maybe, maybe say the Satan or the devil, the Satan, right? So um, before we talk about who he is and go into a little bit more, let's talk about what he's not. And, I'm, and I'm, I believe that everybody knows this, but maybe for the person watching at home, you, you don't understand. He's not some chubby little red guy with a tail, pitchfork, right, and horns. He's not that guy. He's not sitting on your shoulder with, you know, the red outfit and stuff like that going, hey, you should sin. It's not that guy. We, I think we've made him out of, into a cartoon these days, and it might have diminished the actual influence that he has on us sometimes because we've made him into a cartoon. So I think we have to understand he's a real menace. He's, he's really, he's real. He's real. Hell is real. But heaven is real. Amen? Amen. That's what I'm looking forward to. But he's real. So he's not some cartoon guy. Like I said earlier, he's not, it's not Lucifer. That, that's Latin. That's when it was the, the Hebrew and Greek were translated into Latin. That's where we got the name Lucifer from. So 
listen, if you want to call them that, go ahead, but that's, it's Latin, it's not in the original. The original uh, biblical authors didn't want to give, give this time, the, the, this, blah, didn't want to give this guy the time of day, the honor that it, it meant to give him a proper name. So let's, let's not give him the honor that he doesn't deserve at all. So who is he, though? What does the Bible say? How does the Bible describe this dude, this enemy? First of all, he is a spiritual being who rebelled. He thought he could be God. He probably was jealous of the authority, jealous of us, didn't like the authority, all that kind of stuff. So he said, I can be God. I can be. So he rebelled. The Bible, actually, the author of the book of Revelation, um, in the, the, the last book of the Bible, the author of the book of Revelation, his name is John. John understood what all the biblical authors had said about him and kind of condensed this description of him uh, in, in one verse, in, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And it says, uh, This great dragon, that's one way to describe This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the uh, serpent, called the devil or the Satan, the one deceiving the whole world. Right, so he's deceiving the whole world. He's, he's like a dragon. There's dragons in the Bible. How cool is that? <laughs> the serpent, uh, the devil, the Satan. If you look in Genesis, in the, the early uh, chapters of Genesis, they describe him as a snake. Right? If you look in the book of Isaiah, it mentions him as a dragon. If you look in the New Testament, though, in 1 Peter, Peter describes him as a roaring lion out there to devour, right? So far, none of these are good. None of these could be construed as, oh, that's okay. No. The last one in John, Jesus himself compared, uh, 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 describes him as a thief. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy, right? Just bad stuff. Bad stuff. John, when he was describing in Revelation 12, 9 right there, he's like, uh, uh, so the, this great dragon, also known as blank, also known as blank, trying to get everybody to understand this is the dude I'm talking about. This is the enemy of our soul. This is who I'm talking Don't be mistaken of who I'm talking I'm talking about the Satan right here. So the Bible calls him those two things that we talked about earlier. The Hebrew word is the Satan. The Hebrew word is actually Satan. Can everybody say Satan? You, bre- you, you speak Hebrew now. Cool. Again, it's not a proper name. It's a title that was given. The Satan means uh, the adversary. And man, doesn't that fit? The adversary, one who opposes, one who stands against. And I'm pretty sure that's pretty fitting for the enemy of our soul. Amen? Man, the accuser is another term. Adversary. If you look in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, they, they used diabolos. Everybody say diabolos. Now you speak Greek. Put it on your resume. Diabolos, and we translate that to the devil, right? So you got the Satan from the he- uh, from the Hebrew Bible, and then you got the devil from the Greek translation. The devil means somebody who slanders, or speaks ill of somebody, or tries to defame a person. And the the funny thing, the interesting thing is in the New Testament, diabolos is used to explain humans too, people who gossip. People who speak maliciously about people. So don't be the devil. Don't be little devils running around everywhere. If I'm going to be a diabolos, I'm going to be a diabolos talking about the devil. I'm going to speak maliciously about him because I hate him, he's stupid, and he's ugly. And his mama's ugly. I was never good at your mama jokes growing up. I was never, because I heard, I was like, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I was like, your mom is. Cool. I, don't know, I, was, I was never really good at it. I, I'm just not good at your mama jokes. Because um, I didn't want him to talk about my mama. I was, anyway, so I was like, oh, I love my mama. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, the Satan, Diabolos, those kind of things. Um, so we've talked about who he is. Let's talk about what he's trying to do, this goal of his. I think sometimes we think because of culture or because of our own thoughts and stuff like that, we think that he's just out there to possess everybody and make their heads turn around, right, backwards and stuff, and just make you do so. That's not really the case. He's got a lot of different ways that he ruins people, but I think the main focus and the thing that we can combat the most 
is that he tries to distract us. If he can take our focus off of God, he wins. If we get distracted and we make life about self, he wins. Because our life is supposed to be God-centered, not self-centered. Your life is supposed to be God-centered, not self-centered. And he distracts us. He think, that's, that's why money is such a big issue in the Bible. Jesus talks about money so much in the Bible because we, we create this wealth for us and we get it, stuff like that. And listen, I'm, I'm okay with it, but we have to be careful, okay? We have to be careful because then we start thinking, well, I did this myself. <laughs> I'm pretty awesome. I don't need God. And it, we're distracted. Then we, because if we live a self-centered life rather than a God-centered life, then we start to think we don't need God, we don't need a Savior, we don't need dot, dot, dot. I'm good by myself. I'm good on my own. So the devil wins when he distracts us away from God. He also wins when we fight amongst ourselves. When we get distracted and we fight amongst ourselves sometimes over trivial things, he's winning. He's winning when we're fighting amongst ourselves over trivial things. Don't let the Satan distract you. Don't let him distract you. That's when he wins, is when he distracts us, when he takes our focus off of God. And I don't know about you, I don't want him to win. Am I, am I the only one? I don't want him to win. I don't want this dude to win. I want him to lose and lose horribly, kind of like when Alabama plays anybody. You know, I want them. To... I'm, I'm going to get hate email. Daniel underscore Wilson at MedinaAG.org. You just email me. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'll be too busy polishing all of our... T- anyway, I'm just kidding. Oh, gosh, I am so off track right now. I don't want him to win. I want him to lose horribly. I want him to be embarrassed. I want him to just be so ashamed of what he's... I want him to lose. I don't want the devil to win at anything. I want him to win at losing. How about that? Does that make sense? I don't know if that I don't know if that's an oxymoron. I don't even think that counts. I don't know, but I want him to lose. But we have an enemy, church. We have an enemy. But logic says that if we have an enemy, biblical logic tells us that we have an ally. Amen. We have an ally. We have a friend. We have a savior. We have God on our side. And that is good news. Why is that good news? Because, spoiler alert, he wins. He wins. God wins. If you, I don't know if you were like me, but I, when in high school and middle school, when you had the summer reading junk that you had to do, you're like, oh my gosh, I just want to have summer. I don't want him to read. But they give you all these books to read, and you're like, oh, I just want to find out what happens at the end of the book. Did you ever do that? Did you cheat? Okay, so, yeah, all right, he wins. Okay, they run away. Okay, we're good. <laughs> I can ace this test. I don't know about you, but I read the, metaphorically the back of the book. God wins. I cheated. I read it. I'm sorry. God wins. Amen. God wins. And there's, a, there's multiple verses that talk about this. I want to focus on a couple of them, though. John 16, 33. Jesus himself says, I have overcome the world. I have beaten the adversary. I have beaten the enemy. I have overcome the world. Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth, his first letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, he says, thanks be to God. He has given us what? Victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I think the devil's going to win if we get focused on the victory that we have, that we've done ourselves, we ain't won nothing. Jesus has won our victory. And we can't let, we can't for a second begin to let pride creep up and say, ha, 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 look what I did. <laughs> no, it's through Jesus Christ. It's through what he did. But I'm going to tell you, and I had this written down. I'm sorry. I had this written down before I heard about Bruce. I, was, I had this throughout this week. And, and, but it's so true. And I want us to get this. Victory looks different in every situation. 
Victory looks different in each situation. Bruce has <laughs> eternal victory right now. Not earthly victory, and that's okay, right? He's okay. <laughs> and so we, we're going to mourn and we're going to grieve. That's fine. That's okay. That's, that's, it's, it's okay. It's biblical. But every situation has a different victory in it, right? You might have lost your house. You might have lost your job during all of this. You might have done this or done that. Your kids might not be speaking to you. You uh, dot, 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 fill in the blank, right? The victory will look different for every person. But I believe that in the end, the overall victory is that God wins and the influence of the Satan is no longer felt. We're no longer distracted because we're focused because because there will be a day and I might be getting ahead of myself. That's okay. There will be a day where we will be face to face with God Almighty, and there will be no distractions because it's going to be perfection. It's going to be holy, and I just can't wait for that day. Amen. All the pain, all the suffering, all the junk that we go through today won't even matter because the victory will have been won amen amen but but we we do have life on earth i get it we do have life on earth and and i don't know if you've ever heard this term but there's a there's something going on whether we see it or not it's called spiritual warfare Right, and I'll be honest with you. I'm I I love like the practical sense of Christianity. Right, I love practicing our faith uh, practically. How does it? How does it, how do I show my faith to my neighbor? Right, how do I show God's love to people at Walmart? It's very hard to do. So no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But no, I'm just but no, no, no. How do I do that practically, right? But I also have to understand, as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ, I have to understand there is a spiritual war going on for me, for you, for our world. And if we miss that, again, we're going to misidentify the real enemy. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6, I don't have it up there, but it's okay. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I think sometimes we need to, to give grace and mercy to our fellow human and understand that there's something deeper going on that we can't see. Amen? Amen. It's so easy to put a face to it, though. Right? And, and, name, and call, call people names and just think they're the worst people ever. It's easy. It's easy. But there's something deeper going on. There's something deeper going on. We, we, I, there is evil in this world, and humans commit that evil. I get it. And we have to fight against that. We have to be what God's about, right? But we also have to see there's something spiritual going on. Especially, especially in our current situation right now. There is something spiritual going on. So I, I think it's imperative to know that we have tools at our disposal that God has given us to fight the spiritual warfare battle. So I want to share about four of them. Again, if I was a good pastor, I'd give you three, but now I'm, I'm, I'm upping it. I got four. I'm, I apologize. So, but spiritual warfare tactics. The first one is this. If you're writing notes, write down the armor of God. Some of y'all were waiting on that. Some of you mm, he's going to talk about the armor of God today. I just know it. Ooh. Some things are not epiphanies. Some things are just right there in front of your face. So the armor of God, um, Ephesians chapter 6, the next verse that I just read, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17, Paul is using an illustration about this spiritual warfare battle we've got. And he uses this illustration um, that I think all the original listeners of this letter would have understood because they saw, they saw soldiers everywhere. And they understood that this armor is something that we have, this, this spiritual armor uh, that we have to, to fight the spiritual warfare. And I want to uh, read it to you. Verse 13 through 17. He says, uh, he's writing to the church in Ephesus and he's and encouraging them to put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be standing firm. Right? Last week I said, everybody, mm, right? So yeah, you were standing firm. Stand your ground. This is the first one. Putting on the belt of truth. Everybody say truth. The body armor of God's righteousness. Everybody say body armor. 
I'm just going to be really immature right now. Your version might say breastplate. I don't like saying breastplate. I'm immature. It's awkward for me to say breastplate, so I don't like saying breastplate. I'm not going to say breastplate again. <laughs> breastplate. Okay. For sure. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes put on the peace. Everybody say peace. That comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith. Everybody say faith. faith. I'm, I'm screaming louder than y'all are right now. Everybody say faith. faith. To stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation. Everybody say salvation. salvation. As your helmet. And take the sword of the Spirit. Everybody say the Bible which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I don't know, you've probably noticed this, again, because you're better Christians than I am and more mature. The only offensive piece of that is the sword, which is the Bible. All the rest of them are defensive, right? They're armor. Because I think we're attacked way more than we uh, go on the offensive sometimes. We're attacked day and night, every hour. The, the, The enemy wants you. The enemy, the enemy wants you to be distracted so much that it's coming nonstop. So we definitely need these defensive things. So I'm grateful for God's truth in our life. I'm grateful that we have God's righteousness. I'm grateful that we have God's peace in our lives. I'm grateful that we have faith in our God. Amen? And I'm grateful that we have salvation and the word of God of God. I'm grateful for those. Those are some things that we can use against the enemy in the spiritual warfare. These are some of the tools at our disposal. The second one is this. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17, uh, he gets finished. He, he, he tells you all about these armor, the pieces of armor that you have. And then it's like the next paragraph, he talks about this. And it's like, oh yeah, you've also got this too, which is prayer. Everybody say prayer. 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 Everybody's like, duh. I get it. Again, not everything's an epiphany, okay? But pray. Prayer. Prayer is a tactic that you have to fight the spiritual battles. Amen? Prayer. In in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, which is the next verse after what I stopped reading, it says this, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. It does not say pray when you feel like it. It does does not say uh, pray as a last resort. It says, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I think, in, I, think, I think prayer is undervalued sometimes because we use it as a last resort instead of a first strike. Right? I remember years and years ago after 9-11, our military went in and what was it called? Shock and awe. Right? Shock and awe. I, and, I, and I never heard that term before. And now you hear that term. It's like, oh, that, you know, that's a, it's a coined phrase. People say, shock and awe. And that means you're just going to, boom, right at the get-go. You're just going to shock and awe. And they're going to be like, oh, I'm so shocked and awed. Right? It's just, it's going to happen. So we, use, we need to use prayer as a shock and awe tactic, not as a last resort. Amen. That was good, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Prayer is a tactic that is underused and undervalued, but necessary in the fight against our enemy. The third one is this, testimony. Testimony. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, They have defeated him, the enemy, the Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent, also known as dot, dot, dot. Defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their what? testimony. Our testimony wouldn't be any good if it weren't for the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Our testimony means jack squat without the blood of the Lamb. It's because of that. Again, don't get prideful. Don't get distracted. Don't think this is self-centered. Oh, yes, I have a testimony. (laughs) It's because of Jesus that you have a testimony. The accuser can never disprove your testimony. The adversary, the enemy of your soul, can never disprove it. What you've been through, what you've been forgiven of, can never be taken away. It happened. It happened. The world will come and say, I don't know. I don't know about that. 
The accuser will come and say, that's not true, that really didn't happen. We have faith, we believe in faith that God has forgiven us of our sins. Amen? And it's that faith that builds that testimony. If you ever watch YouTube or Facebook videos and stuff like that, and there's like somebody trying to do a trick shot, and it's like a once in a million, a one in a million type shot, right? And always the, I don't know, I see the, the caption of it is, haters will say it's fake. You ever see that? Haters will say it's fake. Well, haters will say it's fake about your testimony, but you know. You know. You have the faith. You believe. You have that faith. You know what the blood of the Lamb has covered in your life, what the blood of the Lamb has wiped clean from your slate. Amen? And the Bible says that God never brings it up again. He doesn't hold it against you ever again. How awesome is that? Your testimony can overcome the enemy. I know the Satan that I used to do this. But God has forgiven me, and I've moved away from that, and I'm working towards a, a righteous life. And I, I no longer have that against me. But he's, he's going to try to bring it up. He's going to try to accuse you, right? He's going to try to be an adversary to you, your enemy. But your testimony, because of the blood of the Lamb, has, has wiped that away. Amen? Also, the last one is this. That's a spiritual warfare tactic. That is a tool at your disposal. Hope. Everybody say hope. Hope. Hope tells us and helps us through pain, loss, heartache. Because we have the hope that it's all temporary in the light of heaven. Amen. The things that we go through in life all the suffering that happens, all the hatred that happens between humans, man. It's all temporary. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, he's writing this letter to the church in a town called Philippi, which is probably the coolest name ever. Philippi, he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as, Savior, as our Savior. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into the glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Again, asserting that he wins, everything will be under his control. And we are citizens of heaven. That is our hope. That is our hope. That whatever happens on this world, we have hope in heaven. Because this is not our home. This is not our home. We are sojourners in this world. We are just traveling about. Listen, I'm grateful. I'm grateful I'm born in America. Right? I, I'm, I mean, I'm... You have to understand, you are blessed to be born in this country. But this is not my home. This is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven. I'm going to fight for heaven more than anything else. I'm going to fight to bring people to heaven with me more than anything else. Because that's the main focus. This is not our home. This is not our home. So the hope that we have is that God wins. God wins. Again, this temporary stuff that's happening, the pain, the loss, the suffering, it's rough sometimes. I think everybody can agree with that. It's rough. Bad stuff happens. But it's temporary. We have to believe it's temporary because our hope tells us that God has won. Amen? Can you say that with me? One, two, three. God has won. One more time. God has won. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. 
I want you to think about what's going on in your personal life right now. Maybe there's pain. Maybe there's loss. Maybe there's heartache. Maybe there's some type of suffering. And I want you to think and I want you to have the hope and I want you to say this out loud with me. Think about those situations in your life. The circumstances you're, you're in. And on the count of three, I want you to say that phrase again with me. God is one. All right, you ready? One, two, three. God has won. Can you believe that this morning? Can you believe that this morning? I'm not some prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not. Listen, I know bad things happen, right? And I'm not talking about that God wants you to be rich and everything good happens to you. All that. I'm not about that at all. I know that there will be pain and suffering. The Bible's clear on that. We'll suffer for being Christians. Bring it on. But I will tell you that God has won. Amen? I want us to do one more thing. Can we, can we close our eyes? I don't, we do this in, in MAG students sometimes. This is just so that we don't embarrass or, or single out anybody. But I, I, I've, I feel like giving this opportunity to people this morning... Because I think there might be some people here that maybe have heard this message of hope for the first time. They've heard this, or maybe it's the thousandth time they've heard it, but something's clicking in them right now. And they say, Daniel, I've, I've heard this message of hope. I, I've got so much going on in my life. I need hope. I need that joy that you're talking about. And now I understand that it's through Jesus Christ that I can have that hope and that freedom from the shame, the guilt that I've had, that I'm carrying around. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to ask this question real quick. And again, this is not to single you out or to embarrass you. Nobody's looking. I'm going to look so I can celebrate with you. And this, is, this little thing is not some magical thing that when you, when you do it, it works. This is just a physical expression to God showing that you are making this decision. If you want to say, I want Jesus to be my Savior this morning. I want freedom from the guilt and the shame and the, the junk in my life. I want freedom from that. If it's your first time or a hundredth time, can you raise your hand this morning and let God know that you're making that decision? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe God sees those hands. And he recognizes the decision that you're making. And if you'll permit me, I want all of us to say this prayer. Again, we're not trying to embarrass anybody or single anybody out. But so we're all going to say this prayer. And again, this is not some magical phrase or words put together that if you say it, it works. It, it comes from the heart. God knows your heart. I just want to lead you in a prayer. So if everybody in this room, whether you've prayed this prayer before or not, and if you raise your hand for the first time or a hundredth time and you're praying this prayer, God knows your heart. And if you, if you mean what you say, the Bible says that he's faithful to forgive. So if everybody could repeat after me, dear God, thank you for loving me and even when I didn't love you. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sins. I believe he rose on the third day and is alive in heaven waiting on me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Please help me to live for you as I make you Lord of my life. Thank you, God, for loving me and helping me to live for you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. There were people that prayed that prayer for the first time. Can we give them a hand this morning? Man, listen. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The Bible says right now there's a, there's a big old celebration party happening in heaven right now. And man, we, we want to celebrate with you. If you have any questions about that prayer that you just mentioned, uh, there's this book back there at the Welcome Center. It's free. 
It's free for anybody, right? And it's called Fresh Start with God, and we want to give that to you for free. So if you're interested in what this book means or that decision that you just made, you're like, okay, what now? This book will help. All right, we want to resource you uh, to learn how to be a disciple of Christ. Guys, thank you so much for being here this morning. We love you. Continue, continue, continue to pray for Patty and her family, the Saul's givers, and pray that Pastor Adam stays healthy and safe. Amen. We love you guys. Thank you so much for coming today. Go out there and love one another. Amen.